if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Amen? I love a church, and I think the church's purpose is to lift up the Lord. And when we begin to do anything else, we're, we're settling for second best. There are a lot of good things that can be done, but there's no greater job that's ever done than to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Good. How many glad you're here? Yeah. Amen. I hope you are. I hope you'll let the Lord encourage you, speak to you. Thank you, ladies, for the wonderful song. Jonah this morning, the, jo- the book of Jonah, chapter number 4. Jonah, chapter number 4. And uh, Brother Craig, turn the fans on for me, if you would, please. Jonah, chapter number 4. I want to make sure everybody stays awake today. Amen? Jonah, chapter number 4. Look with me, if you would, please. Begin reading in verse number 1. You're there in Jonah chapter number 4. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. Let me uh, say this as well. Tonight during our evening service, our young people that went to camp this week, they had a tremendous week at camp, made some wonderful decisions, and uh, I believe the Lord stirred their heart. I pray God will stir our hearts and that we'll do everything we can to try to encourage them to keep growing and moving forward for the Lord. Uh, They're going to be sharing some of that with us in the evening service. And so I want you to make your plans to be here, encourage them, and uh, they'll, they'll be a blessing to us. I love to hear how God is speaking and how God is working in their life. Amen. I believe God speaks to them. And uh, some of our young people settled the matter of their eternity this week. Some of them got assurance of their salvation. Some of them got called to missions. Some of them got called to preach. And uh, listen, that's the work of the Lord. And I hope that we'll remember that. And I hope that you'll let God speak to you this morning. Look in Jonah chapter number 4, verse number 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarsus. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what will become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm. And when the morning rose the next day, it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted. And he wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored. Neither madest it to grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. I want you to turn your attention back to verse number four, where the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Jonah and he asked him a question. Dost thou well to be angry? Over in verse number 9, he asked the same question again of Jonah. Dost thou well to be angry for the gourd? Dost thou well to be angry? Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. We need your guidance. We need your strength. Lord, I can't do this on my own. And so, Lord, empty me of myself. And God, I pray that you would strengthen us as we look into the word of God this morning may you help us and Lord may as the choir sang this morning you heal our land may you help us to see your hand moving and desire to see you work above all things Lord it is only you that can do what needs to be done 
And so, Lord, we ask you to help us to be vessels that can be used for your honor and glory. Bless this service now for the next few moments. Would you be with us? In Jesus' name, amen. There are a lot of things that can make us angry. There are many things that can get us upset. As we look out across our nation today, we can see many things and recognize that there are many things that do not please the Lord. I believe, as I said earlier, that this country was founded upon biblical principles. But I believe that she has gone away from righteousness and truth. And because of that, we've seen a catastrophic effect upon our nation. We've seen a nation that once used to be a light and a beacon for liberty become a testimony for unrighteousness, a testimony for rebellion. And often as we look at the culture and we look at society, uh, we can get angry. It bothers me the way some people behave today. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with being angry. The Bible says that we're to be angry, but we're not to allow it to consume us. He says, be angry and sin not. There's nothing wrong with standing against unrighteousness. There's nothing wrong with standing against those things that displease the Lord. There's nothing wrong with standing against things that do not honor God. There's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, God expects that from us. But as we look across the culture, it doesn't take us long to get angry. I can't watch the news. I couldn't watch the news the last eight years, and I can't watch the news the first two years of this presidency. If you believe what you hear on TV, friend, you, you are just simply ignorant. That's a good word. The media has for so long consumed and controlled the attitude and direction of our nation, somebody needs to tell them to take a hike. I, don't, I can't watch the news. I'll get angry. I'll get stirred up. I'll get, here's a good word, plumb mad. It's amazing sometimes certain things before I, before I, uh, before I stop watching the news and uh, I, I would turn it on and, and they would report something and and I would sit in the chair and talk to them like they could hear me. How many of you have ever done that? They don't care one thing about what you're saying. But buddy, I could get fired up, man. I could get mad. And the Bible says that Jonah gets upset here. Jonah gets upset for a weird reason. He's angry. And we look across our nation, and we look across the world that we live in, and we look at America and what she once was and what she is becoming. And friend, if, if men of God do not stand in the pulpits of God and proclaim the word of God, thus saith the Lord, and stand in the middle of the highway as a stop sign to the direction of this nation, then this country is going to go down the tubes. I'm thankful for men of God. I'm thankful for preachers who come along and, and proclaim the truth of God's Word even when we don't like it and it doesn't feel good and it's not what we want to hear because they're trying to help us. They're trying to, hey, wave the banner and say, hey, you better pay attention to what's going on in your life. This country is headed the wrong direction and we need to proclaim the truth of God and preach the Word of God so that people of God will get right with God. It is not the world that has caused the country to go down the tubes. It is the fact that God's people have not gotten close to God. They haven't walked with God. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, stop trying to fix the world and stop trying to tell the world where they're going wrong and take a look in the mirror and look at the problems in our lives and ask God to help us to turn from our wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land according to the word of God it is not the decisions of the laws that are destroying our nation it is the decisions of those who claim to know the Lord that are sending this country in the wrong direction we don't like to hear that we've so long measured ourselves against the standard of men and women around us that we believe we're doing pretty good. But friend, the standard is not men and women around us. It's not the people that we live with. It's not the people that we go to church with. The standard in our life must be Jesus Christ. And when we fall short of Him, then friend, that's it. We fall short. And we must desire to get right. Jonah, you know the story if you've been in church. 
God says, Jonah, I got a job for you. Look with me, if you would, please, in chapter number 1, where the Bible says in verse number 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. You know the story. The Bible says here that their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah had a personal reason to not want to go to Nineveh. He didn't like those people. They were his enemy. They were hurtful. They were mean. They were wicked. And Jonah said, I don't want to go there. And, of course, you know the story that Jonah runs, verse number 3, but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go, from, go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Stop for here for just a moment. You'll find there as you read that story, when Jonah begins to flee the will of God for his life, the Bible always refers to it as from the presence of the Lord or down away from God or, 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 or moving in the direction opposite of God's will. You can always find someone to help you get away from where God wants you. That's why we get up and we preach so hard about, hey, hang out with the right people. Be around the right crowd. Surround yourself with godly people that will encourage you and help you in the things of the Lord. Because if you don't, it won't take long. You'll be following the same direction as the crowd has followed. And the sad thing in our country today, Brother Jesse, is that not that there's a, a, a group of, not that there's a people that is following the crowd, that's following the culture, but the church has hitched its wagon to a culture and it's following a direction and we're becoming more concerned about pleasing men rather than pleasing a God of heaven that redeemed our soul. Amen. You listen to churches. You listen to churches. You, you find churches where preachers get up and they preach the truth, friend. They're, they're not the booming churches. They're not the churches with a great crowd because people don't want to hear that today. They want to hear, hey, feel good about yourself. Do the best you can and everything's fine, friend. Hey, the standard is Jesus Christ. And when we fall short, friend, we must desire to get right. Quit hitching the wagon to the culture and start tying yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and go to him, not from him. And the Bible says that Jonah went from the presence of the Lord and the Bible says that God got on him. You know the story. Jonah's asleep in the bottom of the ship, man, and everything's fine. And the storm blows. And they start trying to figure out how to, how to, how to solve the problem. Isn't it interesting? The Bible says, look with me if you would please, in verse number 7. So the shipmaster came into, I'm sorry, not verse number 7, verse number 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind of the sea, and there was a great and mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likened to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man into his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten, to lighten it of them. Stop for just a moment. Get this. This ain't even my message. Let me tell you something. When you start to get away from the Lord, when you start to get away from God and you start to run from God, and as a nation, when we begin to move from the presence of God, You'll start believing anything is good enough. It didn't matter how much they threw off the ship. The ship was going down. It didn't matter how much they got rid of. It didn't matter how much that they, they thought and came up with a different idea. Listen, when you begin to run from God, you're running the wrong direction. The Bible says that they begin to throw everything off the ship. They said, we're going to come up with a better idea. This will save us. You'll find one day, friend, when you stand before the Lord, that all the good things and all the works and all the good intentions that you had can never be enough to save you. It is only Jesus Christ that can redeem. The Bible says, But Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thou, call, up, uh, call upon thy God, if so that God will think upon us, and we will not perish. They said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots, and we may know whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. It's interesting that it took, it, 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 God, God eventually revealed the problem. Isn't that how it is so often in our life? And it is and, and it, it, so often in our country. We blame this, we blame this, we blame that, we blame that. Eventually God reveals the problem. He said, here's the problem. Man, we, we, have a, we have a culture today that they, they do not want to accept responsibility. You tell me, listen to me, uh, America's known as the melting pot. 
I want anyone to come to America that comes the right way. Amen? Hey, I'm glad. Hey, our doors are open, but there's a door you got to walk through. So before you believe that pastor doesn't want anybody here, you just simply mistaken. Just come the right way. But it's interesting to me, it, it, the irony of a, of a news media that will get up and, and complain, and justifiably so, and worry about the lives of little children coming from another country and yet murder 60 million of their own babies. That just doesn't make sense to me. Somebody's elevator's not reaching the top floor. And yet we sit around like, hey, this is just normal. This is how it's supposed to be. It's not normal. It's amazing to me how, we, how we'll proclaim and we'll stand up and we'll have groups that, that get up and, and stand for certain rights and stand for certain privileges, yet deny the privileges that God has foreordained in His Word. The Bible says that, listen, they begin to go the wrong direction. The ship begins to go down. And when you begin to go the wrong direction, the ship's going to go down. And God gets Jonah where he wants him. Make a note of this, and please never forget it. The most powerful work in your life is the personal work of God. The most powerful work in your life is the personal work of God. God knows how to get us right where he wants us. God knows how to put us in the belly of the whale so that he has our undivided attention. You say, well, Pastor Brian, God won't do that. Can I tell you that the same man who wound up in the belly of the whale at the end of the chapter, look what he says, if you would please. Go back there, if you would please. This is what Jonah said about God. He said, but it is verse number two, and he prayed in the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in thy country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarsus. Listen to this. For I knew that thou art a what? Gracious God. Merciful. Slow to anger. Great kindness. And repentest thee of the evil. The Bible says Jonah knew when he was in the belly of the whale. He said, I know what kind of God I serve. I know why I'm here. And when God gets you, I'm not talking about you, sir, and your wife, and I'm not talking about you, ma'am, and your children, and I'm not talking about you and your church family, but when God gets you right where he wants you and he begins to do that personal work in your life, son, it will accomplish more than we could ever accomplish on our own. The most powerful work in our life is the personal work of God. When God gets Jonah here. You say, Pastor Brian, the message is about Nineveh. They needed to get right. I don't believe that's the message of Jonah. Did Nineveh need to get right? Yes, they did. As a matter of fact, when you begin to read the story in this chapter, in this passage of Scripture, not much is said about Nineveh except they needed to get right. But more is said about Jonah. Because the problem in the world in which we live is not wickedness. Can I tell you that from the day that man was created, Satan began to devise a plan. And wickedness was born. Sin was born. The Bible says that Satan carried out his plan. And the Bible says that he deceived Eve. Can I tell you, we live in a world that's deceived. Drugs will never bring you happiness. Alcohol will never bring you happiness. A relationship will never bring you happiness. Certain, certain job will never bring you happiness. Certain bank account will never bring you happiness. It's amazing to me, just over the last few weeks, the people that have been blessed financially that have taken their own life. will never bring you happiness. When God begins to do His personal work, when God begins to do His personal work in our life, it is the most powerful work. The wickedness that takes place in this world has always been. And here's what happens. We get angry. We get angry. Have you ever seen two people get angry? You ever seen somebody get mad? I'm talking mad. I mean, they just got mad. Timothy, you ever got mad at anybody, man? You never hurt anybody, have you? All right. Your brother, amen. That always happens, right? I mean, you have siblings, right? Good. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? Man, you can tear them limb from limb, beat them in the head. I mean, do whatever you want to do to a sibling. But if somebody else tries to do it, you want to beat them up, right? <laughs> you ever seen two people get angry at each other? Well, they get angry at each other and say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to talk to them. By the way, I preached on Wednesday night about how to deal with offenses, how to, how to handle 
problems in our life when we get upset or we get angry or we get offended, how to deal with that biblically. But we'll get upset at each other and we'll say, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to speak to them. I'm not going to, we're, we're just going to, we'll get angry. We'll get upset and we'll just isolate ourselves from that issue. Preachers are the worst. Sometimes we, 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 we'll get up and, and we'll identify the problems of the USA. We'll, pro, we'll identify the problems of our culture and we'll do it in anger. We'll be mad. We'll be angry. And we'll get upset and that's where it stops. Jonah goes and he preaches to Nineveh. And can I tell you that that, that great work of God is always the work of bringing you closer to Him. That great work, that personal work that God does, that powerful work that God does is always that work of bringing you closer to Him, not from Him like Jonah was doing, not running from Him, not trying to get away, but trying to get close to Him. And Jonah goes and he preaches, and look what the Bible says. He says, the entire city gets right. What a revival. Well, we need revival in our nation. We need revival in our country. We need, we need for people to... to get saved when the gospel is given. The gospel is not just something that is a part of, of our statement of faith. It's just not a, a, a part of what we do. Friend. The gospel is everything. If you don't believe the gospel, you're going to die and go to hell. No man, we talked about it in our cross point class this morning, there is no other way to get to heaven except the gospel way. Believing the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin of unbelief, anchoring your faith in Him and Him alone, trusting His payment for your sin, and accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior. That is the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. We need a lost world to get saved. But I believe the greatest work that we see in the book of Jonah here was not the work that was done at Nineveh. It was the personal work that was done in the life of Jonah. God's a messenger, the preacher, the Christian, the one who'd been serving the Lord, doing what he was supposed to do. And I tell you, I don't care how long you've been in church, I don't care how long you've been saved, or where you're at in life, every one of us are in need of God reviving our life. We're in need of God stirring our heart. We can become so ritualistic. We can go through the routine and we can live our Christian life in front of everybody else and it's a wonderful thing and everybody's doing well. Everybody's blessed. Yet deep down inside in our heart we know, God, there's something missing. It's not what it used to be. We don't get stirred for the things of God, the Word of God, the, the house of God doesn't mean as much to us as it once did. God, there's something missing. And God says to Jonah, dost thou well to be angry? Is that all you have, Jonah? You just want to get mad at what everybody else is doing? You just want to get upset at, at all the wickedness that's going on? Jonah, is that really the problem in your life? Dost thou well to be angry? It's interesting to me sometimes in my own life how when the Lord deals with me and how, how the conviction of the Holy Spirit deals with my own heart. And by the way, when you do wrong as a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God will convict you of your sin. Let me say that again. Let me say it more plain. You cannot live in sin as a child of God without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you say, I'm a born-again child of God. I've, I've asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I've placed my faith and trust in Him. And you live in sin. And there is no conviction of the Holy Spirit. According to the Word of God, you're a liar. Not Pastor Brian. You read it for yourself in 1 John. The Bible says if we live in sin and there's no conviction, he said we make Him a, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. When you're saved, you're a child of God, God says, there's conviction of the Holy Spirit. And Jonah, God says, listen, Jonah, you can get mad at Nineveh all you want to. He said, but Nineveh is not the problem. Christian, Nineveh is not the problem in our life. The good old U.S. of A. is the greatest country on the face of this earth. Listen, I'm an American from five feet above my head to six feet below my feet. When they bury me, they'll bury me in America. I love our country. 
That doesn't mean I hate everybody else. But I'm proud of our nation. I love our military. Amen. I love our military. We need to teach our young people to appreciate and respect these men and women that serve our nation. When one of them walks in a room, you stand up, shake their hand, and the first thing you say is thank you. So I don't know the kind of person they are. They're the kind of person that's willing to put a uniform on to defend your freedom. I love our country. And God's convicted me. I pray for our president. Sometimes I pray that his days may be short and his days in office may be short. But I do pray for our president. I don't agree with everything our current president does. But I like the fact that he likes America. Oh, you ain't supposed to get political in church. That's all right. They'll take away your, what do they call it? Your 5013CCXKBWHYZ status. I love America. I love our country. But the problem in America is not America. Dost thou well to be angry? Oh, we're good at pointing everybody else's problems out. Can I tell you, the lost will always behave like the lost. Those who do not know the Lord will always act like they do not know the Lord. The problem is that God's people have started acting like the world rather than acting like Christ. Jonah, get, can you think about it. Here's an evangelist, evangelist Jonah. I mean, he was a headliner of the day. He was at all the big meetings, Brother, Brother Donnie. I mean, sword of the Lord, pastor school, revival services. Brother Jonah was there. And he goes to Nineveh, and the entire city gets right, and Jonah gets mad. It's amazing how, how out of line our thinking can become when we get out of sorts with God. When the, when the sin in our own life is identified, it's amazing how we want to justify it. And God says, no, don't, Jonah, we're going to deal with the real problem here. So why are you angry? Why are you angry? Can I tell you, there's some things. Jonah knew, Jonah knew what God's will was. Jonah knew that God desired those men to be saved. Why else would he send them? If he didn't care about them, he would have just annihilated them and, and uh, uh, not wasted Jonah's time. But God didn't want them to be annihilated. God wanted them to be redeemed. Jonah goes and he preaches a message and he gets upset. And here's what he says. Look with me if you would, please. First thing I want you to see is the Bible says about Jonah, he says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Number one, I want you to see a severe choice. Jonah makes a choice to get angry at what God is trying to accomplish. And you say, Pastor Brian, that'll never be me. I'll never do that. Can I say to you in our country, there are some things that are taking place today that we once said would never happen in America. It'll never, I'll never go that far. We've arrived there. We're allowing things to be paraded in front of this generation. It's no wonder we have a confused generation in front of us. It's because we got a, knuckle, a bunch of knuckleheads sitting in places of power that are promoting confusion. I heard someone just recently uh, in, in an interview, and uh, I, I'll get my news sometimes from the, from the uh, Drudge Report. And uh, I, I heard someone just recently in an interview, they were talking about a kid being a certain age. And, and this, this person made the comment, one of the lines in the, in the, in the story that was being uh, uh, reported was, how, how do they know if they're male or female? They aren't old enough to decide that yet. I thought, friend, they didn't decide it. God did. And what God decides is always right. It doesn't need to be improved upon. It doesn't need to be corrected. It doesn't need to be changed. That's the problem. We're teaching our young people that, listen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's right and what's wrong. You do whatever you want and everything will be just fine. That is not the truth of the Bible. But the struggle is this, is that many of God's people have become accepting of that. You see where the Southern Baptist Convention elected a new president. He said, we're going to get more in line with the culture. I'm talking about 
Listen, I'm talking about men and women that I know, men that have stood behind pulpits in Southern Baptist churches and proclaimed the truth of God's Word, just like your preacher preaches here, are now attached themselves to a, to a movement that says we are going to get more in line with the culture. Friend, what about getting more in line with God? What about getting more in line with truth? What about standing proclaiming the problem is we've made a choice to go the opposite direction of what God says is right. I'm not talking about the country. I'm talking about the Christians who know what is right. He said there's a severe choice. He says Jonah became displeased. He became displeased. He became, listen to me, we, we, are, we are in a, in a world, we're in a culture, and when I say that, I'm not specifically referring to, to the lost and to the, the country, but I'm talking about the church. Listen, we've had to, to, to make church attractive. We've had to turn it into a production. It's almost like a Las Vegas show every week to draw the crowd. You know I'm right. I'm painting the line pretty straight right now. We have, friend. Listen to me, I'm not against new things. But when those new things become more important than the truth, there's a problem. And pastors and staff and workers and people are driving themselves crazy trying to figure out the next big idea to take and attract somebody else. Friend, listen to me, we can give you all the production that you want, but if we don't give you the gospel and the truth, we haven't helped anybody. You're going to come in and leave the same way you were when you walked in the door. It is the, the Bible said it's the preaching of God's word. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. God's chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. And we've got a bunch of Christians who've attached themselves to this idea that we're going to become more accepted of the culture than we are of Jesus Christ. That's a severe choice. You better be careful. Hey, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Let me help you. Can I help you for a little bit? I hope you've gotten some help so far. You still with me? Amen. Amen. Listen, you be careful about defining Christianity with cultural terms. Listen, you don't have to improve upon what God said is right. You define them with biblical terms. We've become so cultural, cultural friendly in the world in which we live that that we, we use terms now to define salvation that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a follower. What in the world does that mean? I've seen people follow wrong crowds all the time. My dad used to say to me, son, I'd get in trouble. And I'd say, well, so-and-so did it. And he'd say, well, so-and-so jumped off the bridge. Would you do it too? Hey, I'm just not going to follow everything. Hey, I'm a child of God. I'm anchored my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. You say, how, why do you think that word follower came along? Here's another one, believer. There's nothing wrong with that word. Why do you think those kind of words come along? Because the world wants to do everything they can to remove Christ from the equation. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. Hey, I'm not, and listen, be careful. I'm not full of pride and arrogancy because I know in a moment I fall every day. In a moment. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Church, let me say something to you. Stop, stop making that severe choice that you're going to hitch your wagon to the culture and become more accepted of the culture and, and more pleasing to the culture rather than pleasing Jesus Christ. Amen. Secondly, I want you to see this. Not only that, look at me if you would please in verse number 1 of chapter 4 again. He says, but it, it pleased Jonah... It displeased John exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, Lord, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. He said, Lord, here's why. Here's why I ran. Get this. He says, God, here's why I ran from you, why I fled to Tarshish. It makes absolutely no sense. Look. For I knew that thou art a gracious God. And, the, and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness. Why is it that God's people today, those that have been taught, those that have been taught what is right, why is it that we see, you listen, listen to me, statistics will tell you, young people who are raised in church, 
when they get 18, 19, 20 years old, and mom and dad let them start making their own decisions, they are running from the truth. They're running from a God, get this, that is gracious, that is merciful, that is slow to anger, that is kind. They're running from that. Why is it? I'll tell you why it is. Because Satan has infiltrated the pulpits and the classrooms and the teaching of God's house. Can I tell you something? The Christian life is not just a set of rules. It's not just a set of rules you've got to follow to be accepted. By the way, salvation is not earned. Because you follow the rules and you, you, you go to visitation and you, you show up at church and, and you pray when, before your meals, doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Salvation is not earned. Salvation is a gift that is given. It is a gift that is given. And, and we've bought into this idea and the, the culture is infiltrated. Well, I've got I to be accepted of these people and this group and this thing and, 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 and accomplished this way. No, no, listen to me. There's nothing more freeing than the liberty that we find in Jesus Christ. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We talk about freedom. I'm glad we have freedom here in our country. We have freedom because of the Lord, first of all. There is no freedom. America would not know freedom if there was no Jesus Christ. That's why when you read the, the beginnings of our country, you'll find the laws and you'll find the principles that governed our nation were biblical principles. Because they understood that true freedom was found in Jesus Christ. True freedom was found in the Lord. There is no freedom without the Lord. Tristan, there's no freedom. You'll never have liberty. You'll never have freedom until you first know Jesus Christ. We've passed it down and we've preached it as preachers. We've gotten angry at the sin and that's where we've left it. But let me tell you, there's, there's freedom in Christ. Out on our sign right now, you'll find it. The greatest life ever lived is the Christian life. But why is it so many of us are running from it? A God that is gracious. A God that is slow to anger. A God that is merciful. And a God that is kind. Jonah said, I fled because I knew these things about you. Why did Jonah get upset? Because Jonah didn't want what God wanted. God wanted Nineveh to be saved. Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. God wanted Nineveh to be redeemed. Jonah wanted Nineveh to be condemned. God wanted Nineveh to have an opportunity at life. And Jonah wanted God to show Nineveh death. You see, when we don't want what God wants, we're moving the wrong direction. When you don't want what God wants, there's sure condemnation. There was a severe choice. The last thing I'll give you this morning. There's a second chance. Aren't you glad there's a second chance with the Lord? Look at Jonah. He's mad at God for saving the city. As a matter of fact, he hates Nineveh so much, even though they got right with God, here's what he wants God to do. He said, Lord, even though they got right with you, just take them on to heaven now. That's what he wanted. That's why he went and set out. Look, if you would, please, verse number uh, 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. And there made him a booth and sat under it to the shadow that might see what would become of the city. Man, I, he's a wicked Nineveh. These, these people of Nineveh, they're wicked. God's going God's to light them up. I got a front row seat. The Bible says he made him a booth. I mean, like he was at a theater somewhere, you know, watching something. Man, this is the best action movie ever, man. God's going to wipe this whole city out, and I got a front row seat. What does God do? He lets him sit there. The Bible says, don't miss this, Christian. The Bible says in the story of the prodigal son. Can I tell you? The prodigal son is not a picture of the world. Once I'm a child of God, I'm always a child of God. The prodigal son is not a story about somebody that's not saved getting saved. The prodigal son is a story 
of a son that knew what was right, but ran off to the far country. And the Bible says, where did he find himself? In the hog pen. And here's what God let him do. Pay attention to me, please. He let him sit there. You know what God let Jonah do on the side of, east side of the city? He let him sit there. And as long as you're running from God and you don't want anything to do with God, God will let you sit right where you are. I can't figure out why God's not using me. Preacher, he don't ever ask me to pray. It's amazing some of the things we let bother us. He didn't ask me to teach a class. Man, I, I never get to do anything. I never get, I, I, you know what God's doing? Maybe God's just letting you sit there. God's just letting you sit there because your heart's not right. What did Jonah want? He wanted him to destroy the city. God light it up. God said, you just sit there, Jonah. But even in the midst of all that, you see, what did Jonah knew? He knew God was gracious. Look with me if you would, please. And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might shadow his head, deliver him from his grief. And Jonah was glad for the gourd. Oh, I'm thankful I got this gourd now. Here's a city. Here's a city God's redeemed, and Jonah's angry, but he's got a gourd and he's happy. And the Lord said he caused a, a vehement east wind. I believe we've had some of those the past couple days. Amen. A vehement east wind, and the sun beat on his head. And he fainted. And he wished himself to die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. I wish, I wish I could get every person in this room to understand this. As a child of God, remember the problem in our country is not the wickedness of America. The problem is that God's people haven't stood and, and been right with God enough to do anything about it. I wish I could get every person in this room to, to, to listen and get what I'm saying. Can I tell you, as a child of God, there's nothing the devil can do, nothing the devil can do to take away my eternal life. Everybody with me? Nothing Satan can do to take away. Jared, nothing Satan can do to hinder your eternal life. You received eternal life. You, didn't get e you, you won't get eternal life when you die. The day you trusted Jesus Christ, you received eternal life. Satan cannot change that. But here's where he has most Christians today. Jonah, who just enjoyed, Brother Tom, one of the greatest revivals in biblical in, in, in the scripture, is now sitting on the side of the city wishing that he was dead rather than alive. I can take you to another man named, named Elijah. The Bible says that he went and stood before Ahab and said it's not going to rain. And God took him off for three and a half years. And there was no food. and There was a drought. There was no nothing. And God took care of him for three and a half years on the, by the brook Cherith. He says, you go show yourself to Ahab and, and Jezebel. And he says, listen, you're the reason it hasn't rained. If you'll get right with the Lord, the Lord will send rain. They argued with God, danced around an altar, and God, God didn't, uh, the, their God didn't do anything. God's a bell didn't do anything. And Elijah prayed a 53-word prayer. And fire, fire fell from heaven, consumed the altar, and, and burned the sacrifice. Everything was gone. And God says, I'm going to send rain. And what happens? Elijah runs. He begins to run. You know what he wishes? He wishes he were dead because he's afraid of Jezebel. He's afraid of Jezebel. And I tell you, that's the reason most Christians today are defeated and they're, they're, they're discouraged and they're not standing for God the way they should. It's because they're sitting on the outside looking in, wishing they were dead rather than alive. Because a miserable, I wish I could get every Christian to get it. Because one of the most miserable places you will ever be as a child of God is out of the will of God. I can take you to other people in Scripture and show you they were in the midst of a storm and yet there was great joy in their life. They were in the midst of some of the most darkest times and yet there was great joy. But the most miserable place you can ever be for a child of God is out of the will of God. What does God do? He gives Jonah another opportunity. I'm so thankful for God's grace in our life. I tell you, there's one man standing right here that doesn't deserve it. I don't deserve what God's done for me. Can I tell you, I don't deserve to live in America. I don't deserve to go to Bethel Baptist Church. 
I definitely don't deserve to preach the gospel. I don't deserve eternity in heaven. Jonah said, but I knew about the Lord. He was gracious. He was slow to anger. He was merciful. And he was kind. Jonah made a severe choice. There were sure But we serve a God that gives us second chance. This morning, maybe you're here and you think, you know what, I hadn't really thought about that too often. As a child of God, I've just kind of been going through my routine. But God certainly is gracious. Maybe you're sitting on the sideline and you wonder, why am I here? Maybe God's just letting you sit there, wallow in the hog pen. So how did the prodigal son get, get home? The Bible says he made a choice. He came to himself. He said, I'm in, a, I'm in a rut. Dad used to say, you know what a rut is? Grave with both ends knocked out. I'm just in a rut spiritually. I just can't get out of it. Let me tell you how to get out of it. You better make a choice. You better come to yourself and get to where the Father is. Lord, we love you today. God, I thank you that you care for us. I thank you that you love us. God, I pray that you'd